Hi there, AP Euro students, and welcome to today's lecture on six, Unit 6, Section 3, Reactions, Revolutions, and Reform in the period of 1815 to 1848. You may remember that we can call this period the Age of Metternich because of the Concert of Europe and its attempt to enforce the conservative status quo. <clears throat> we can also call it the Age of Revolutions, which is what you'll really see in this lecture, how many revolutions and, and, and uprisings and rebellions took place against that established conservative order. And it is also sometimes called the age of romanticism, not just for the dominance of the romantic art genre, but also in a way, the politics and the ideologies were, were romantic, you know, they were very idealistic. And frankly, none of these groups, the conservatives, the liberals, the socialists, the nationalists, none of these groups will actually realize their goals in this period, despite all this chaos and violence and upheaval. So let's explore this topic a little bit more. <clears throat> we have two objectives for this unit. And frankly, these objectives can easily be combined into one write-up, which is what I want you to do. The first objective asks you to explain how and why various groups reacted against the existing order from 1815 and instead of 1914, do me a favor, cross that out and write 1848. So we're just going to put focus on that period of 1815, 1848. So explain how and why various groups reacted against the existing order from 1815 to 1848, and then explain how and why different intellectual developments challenged the political and social order from 1815. And again, that's going to be 1848, not 1914. <clears throat> so when you look at these two objectives together, it's really easy to see how they are related. When you are asked to explain how and why various groups reacted against the existing, that's going to be the conservative order, you're going to have to talk about these different intellectual developments, right? So how do these intellectual developments uh, support the resistance against conservatism, right? How did this affect the political order of Europe? How did this affect the social order of Europe? All of these topics should be combined together in your one-page write-up for this lecture. We also have two prominent themes in today's lecture. The first one is states and other institutions of power. That, of course, is a political theme since we will be discussing many revolutions, rebellions, political events like those. And then the second one is cultural and intellectual developments. Since we will be discussing nationalism, liberalism, socialism, and more, those ideologies, those new ideologies of change, reflect are, are considered to be intellectual developments. So we're going to start with liberalism. In class, we talked <clears throat> about what defined modern American liberalism, and you will see that actually there are some significant differences between the classical li liberalism of 19th century Europe and the modern American liberalism that we see in our society today. So if you look at the picture on the right, that may remind you of an important event of the French Revolution. Uh, this is Jean-Paul Marat's depiction of the tennis court oath. The tennis court oath, as you might remember, occurred when the um, renegade members of the third estate were joined by a few other renegade members of the first and second estate to form the new National Assembly. And despite challenges from the king, this group vowed that they would continue to meet until they had produced a new constitution for France. <clears throat> this group was, of course, strongly influenced by Enlightenment ideas and Enlightenment values. And so all of that, you know, the idea of the bourgeoisie coming together, writing a constitution, uh, seizing power for the people, right, creating some type of popular sovereignty, and um, all of that is part of liberalism, all right, that we consider to be this classical political liberalism. So some of the key ideas in classical political liberalism is that the individual is endowed with these natural rights. Okay, so this is an idea that goes all the way back to John Locke. 
of the late 17th century. The idea that the, the individual has these natural rights, according to Locke, they were life, liberty, and property. Um, we also see this replicated in the American Declaration of Independence, where it is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So really, liberalism is about um, protecting the freedom and the well-being of the individual. And liberalism also believes that the primary purpose of the government and society was to protect the natural rights of these individuals, right? So it's all about the government protects the natural rights of the individuals. That is a key characteristic of liberalism. Liberalism, liberalism also tended to favor reform in, uh, through legislation rather than violent revolutions. So again, think of the uh, early French Revolution, the uh, liberal phase of the French Revolution. While yes, there was some violent revolutionary activity like the storming of the Bastille and the Great Fair and the Women's March on Versailles, this group that you see here they really tried to work through developing a new government, right? This was, of course, much more of a dramatic transition than we will see in the 19th century, whereas other political groups will strongly advocate for violent revolutions. Liberals tend to favor reform. Another key characteristic of liberalism is the belief that a state should have a written constitution. Right, so the belief that a state should have a written constitution. And this constitution should, first of all, uh, carefully define the powers of the government. And secondly, it should also protect the rights and privileges of the individual. Again, going back to that idea of natural rights. Now, these constitutions almost always called for some type of representation in the government. So creating a constitutional or representative government for the people. This may be anything from a constitutional monarchy like we see in England to even the formation of republics like we saw for a while in France during the revolution. Now in the early 19th century, republicanism, which is the formation of republics, was still considered a pretty radical idea, even within the context of liberalism. But these, but these, uh, I, the idea of these constitutions, right, uh, clearly define the role of the government, allow for representation, protect the rights of the individual. We see uh, that the examples of these are really um, documents like the Declaration of Independence from the U.S., also the American Constitution, and the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. All of these are great examples of documents that support the values of classical liberalism. Liberals also supported religious toleration, which meant that they also supported the separation of church and state. And finally, the group that really favored liberalism in society was the middle class or the bourgeoisie. So when we, so we can associate conservatism with the upper class, we will associate socialism with the working class, which means liberalism is the middle class, the bourgeoisie. And when you look at this uh, painting of the tennis court oath, the majority of these representatives from the third estate are members of the bourgeoisie. You know, they are the brain of the revolution. They led um, the uh, initial uh, seizure of power, you know, by the National Assembly. They wrote the Declaration of the Rights of Man. They started passing laws and acting like the government. And when we consider why the bourgeoisie was so upset in France, it was because they were excluded from all political power. So that continues in 19th century liberalism. The middle class wanted an extension of voting rights, right? So they wanted to be able to vote. They wanted to be included in that represent, uh, representative government so they could share power with the upper classes. But it is also important to note that liberals 
are not necessarily Democrats in this period. All right. They wanted representation for their social class. They wanted suffrage for their social class. They did not support universal suffrage, which is when everyone has the right to vote. So they did not support that uh, extension of democracy. They also did not support social welfare reform. And in general, they preferred to exclude the working class from power. Now, this is also due to a fear of the working class, uh, a bit of that PTSD that many groups still had from the violence of the French Revolution. But that is one point that is important to remember. The liberals are not Democrats. They do not want to include the working class in this modern idea of liberalism. Now, economic liberalism is um, very similar in a lot of ways to some of the basic concepts of classical political liberalism, especially with this emphasis on the importance of the individual and the protection of the individual. So economic liberalism is mostly inspired by Adam Smith's book, The Wealth of Nations. Adam Smith was, of course, uh, an economic philosopher from Scotland during the Enlightenment. His most famous work uh, is called The Wealth of Nations. This basically becomes the Bible of capitalism in which he advocates for economic individualism. So that's economic individualism. Now, economic individualism required a laissez-faire market. So you might have heard that phrase before, laissez-faire market. It is French for let it be. I'll, I'll spell that for you quickly. Laissez-faire, L-A-I-S-S-E-Z dash F-A-I-R, laissez-faire market. This basically means a total free market. So Adam Smith opposed government intervention in social affairs in economic affairs, in any case, even if it seemed like there was a great need for government interaction, right? So he wanted no government interference. He argued that the most productive economy was the one that allowed for the greatest measure of individual choice. So this supports ideas of early entrepreneurship, and profit seeking, right? Taking risks and, um, and succeeding or failing. A lot of what we see, for example, in Britain in the early industrial revolution. Um, Smith also believed that there was no need for government intervention in the market because the market would always be governed by natural laws. Specifically, he refers to the law of supply and demand which I assume you're all familiar with at this point. And he even came up with this concept called the invisible hand and the belief that this invisible hand would regulate the market, right? The law of supply and demand is basically the invisible hand. Because he was so opposed to any type of government intervention, Obviously, Adam Smith uh, severely opposed mercantilism, um, which was the more dominant form of, um, of economic uh, theory for much of early modern Europe. But, even, but most states were starting to move away from that. Britain was the first and other states on the continent will follow suit. And ultimately, Adam Smith argued that economic liberty, right, so freedom of choice, freedom of opportunity in the economy, that this economic liberty will bring about the maximum good for the maximum number and benefit the general welfare of society. So he truly believed that this was the best economic theory for society, that this would bring about the maximum good for the maximum number. Now, there are two other men that are included in um, the tradition of economic liberalism. They sort of expand upon uh, Adam Smith's basic ideas and values. The first is David Ricardo. So David Ricardo was another British economist, and his main contribution is this idea of the iron law of wages. 
So he basically applies the law of supply and demand to wages. So in the context of the Industrial Revolution, especially with this enormous labor surplus, the price of labor, because there is a surplus, will always trend to the minimum amount necessary to sustain the life of the worker. So we will always have very, very low wages for the working class. And this, of course, comes at the detriment of the working class. We also have Thomas Malthus. Thomas Malthus is famous for his concept of the Malthusian principle. Uh, Malthus basically argued that human population would always outstrip the food supply um, and would perpetuate this poverty. But he also uh, believed that poverty was inevitable. Poverty was a, national, uh, a natural consequence of profit. And he also had a strong bias against the poor, which was very influential in, in, in sort of this cultural bias we see throughout Western uh, civilization. So Malthus, for example, would argue that the poor deserved to be poor, that they brought it upon themselves, that there is something about them which contributes to their poverty. Therefore, it is not appropriate for the government to intervene and uh, support the poor, right? If the government intervenes and provides types of like social welfare program, that's only going to make the issue worse, right? He argues that this population growth is going to outstrip the food supply. Therefore, we need natural population checks, things like famine or war uh, or plagues to limit the population growth. Now, another sort of theme in utilitarianism, uh, or, or in liberalism, excuse me, is this idea of utilitarianism, which becomes uh, more popular in the 1820s and then in the mid-19th uh, century. The founder of utilitarianism is Jeremy Bentham. And uh, Jeremy Bentham took them to think, think of utilitarianism as a slightly more, I don't know, humane approach to liberalism. It might be a way of thinking about it. It does have sort of a dash of that sort of socialist humanitarianism in it, but I would never say that Bentham or John Stuart Mill are socialists. Anyways, Jeremy Bentham was strongly influenced by enlightenment thinkers in this, this, interpretation of socialism. The basic premise of utilitarianism is that the utility, meaning the value, of any proposed law or institution was based on whether it provided the greatest happiness for the greatest number. So that is really the key idea of utilitarianism, that laws and governments and institutions should provide the greatest happiness for the greatest number. Whether or not it did this, whether or not the greatest happiness for the greatest number uh, what was evident, that was, that's what ultimately determined right and wrong, right? That's what determined an effective law or institution versus an ineffective one. So this also suggests a politics that is directed by human happiness a politics that is directed by human happiness rather than politics driven by natural rights or conservatism. And if you're thinking this sounds a little bit like some socialist ideology, especially maybe some more modern socialist uh, or liberal ideology like we see in, 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 in contemporary American society, you're not wrong. Right, Modern liberalism, as we see it in our country today, draws a lot more from utilitarianism than, say, the classical political liberalism, liberalism we, we discussed on the previous slide. In fact, in the context of the uh, contemporary United States, what we see in our political world right now, it is actually the Republican Party, the, cons you know, the conservatives in the United States, that are more likely to support these values of classical political liberalism 
and economic liberalism. Like think of that sort of pull yourself up by your bootstraps mentality. The government should stay out of our business, right? All of that is much more in line with modern American conservatism and utilitarianism, which does support this, uh, uh, some ideas of social welfare reform is probably more evident in modern liberalism and the modern Democratic Party. Now, within the um, theme of utilitarianism, we will also meet one of the most important intellectuals for liberalism in the 19th century, and that is John Stuart Mill. I can guarantee that you will be asked about John Stuart Mill at some point. So John Stuart Mill was strongly influenced by the utilitarianism of Jerry, Jeremy Bentham, but he also drew upon some of the basic values of, of liberalism that we would get from, say, John Locke and other Enlightenment thinkers. So John Stuart Mill's most important work uh, was called On Liberty, and this writing is considered to be the classic statement on the liberty of the individual. So again, it is, a, it is the classic statement on the liberty of the individual because it defines the rights of the individual. Okay, so that, of course, sounds a lot like the values of classical liberalism. But John Stuart Mill also argues that people have, are entitled to absolute freedom of opinion, right? So he really supports this idea of freedom of speech and that the, their freedom of opinion needs to be protected from both government censorship and the tyranny of the majority. Later, John Stuart Mill also was an early advocate for women's rights. So he viewed this idea of natural rights um, as applicable to women as well, which is you know, a shocking concept in the mid-19th century. And so with his wife, Harriet Taylor Mill, he wrote another important work, which is called on the subjugation of women. On the subjugation of women, this was published in 1867. Now, looking ahead, when we, uh, we're going to see uh, the overall impact of liberalism. We'll talk about many of these uh, uh, examples throughout the lecture, but this is just sort of a peek at what to, uh, a peek into what to what's going to come. So liberalism, this classical liberalism, inspired various revolutionary movements in the early 19th century, uh, especially in France, which began the revolutions of 1830 and 1848. Liberalism will also influence the development of constitutions in some areas of Europe. By the end of the century, Almost every European state will have a constitution inspired by elements of liberalism. But even as early as the 1830s and 1840s, about 10 states in the German Confederation will adopt constitutions that uh, embodied key components of liberalism. And in fact, liberalism does find some... Um, success in the German Confederation, right? We talked about the Burschenstaufen, student groups who are motivated by liberalism and nationalism to challenge the uh, conservative status quo. And also Prussia, one of the leading states in the German Confederation, would also adopt um, elements of liberalism, such as creating a, a representative assembly in their state. And this would put them in a really good position to lead German unification later in the century when we get to like the 1860s. But more on that later. Liberalism also influenced reform movements in Britain in the 1830s and 1840s, all the way into, let's say, even the 20th century. This was probably one of the big reasons why Britain managed to avoid any big revolutions in the 19th century. And liberalism would even eventually influence some mild reforms in Russia in the early 20th century. But even so, those reforms in Russia will be far too little too late.
And like I said, we will learn all about these examples uh, throughout the rest of the lecture. For now, we're going to move on to the theme of nationalism. <clears throat> so nationalism uh, originated in the French Revolution and also with Napoleon's conquest across Europe. Um, nationalism, I will say, becomes one of the most powerful forces in modern European history. It really defines many of the politics uh, of the late 19th and early 20th century. It brings us uh, into two world wars, right? Nationalism really becomes one of the defining features of modern Western history in a lot of ways, but especially in Europe in particular. Um, it I, I have often described it as the new religion of Europe. So, like I said, nationalism originated in the French Revolution, um, especially with this idea that the people were loyal to a state, a nation state. They were no longer loyal to a king, which was really the, um, the, the way we defined types of political loyalty prior to the French Revolution. That yes, you might be in France, you might live in France, but your loyalty is not so much defined by your allegiance to the state, to this abstract concept of the nation of France, but no, your loyalty is to the king, whether that is, you know, Henry the, the first or Louis the 14th, but the king was your sovereign and you were loyal to him. But in the French Revolution, uh, people were now loyal to this concept of the French nation state, right? This is the people's revolution. They were fighting the people's war. They formed a people's government. And of course, Napoleon emerged as a nationalist figure, a nationalist hero in, 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 in France, right? He's still regarded very much as a George Washington type character. And then when Napoleon conquered the rest of Europe, of course, he sort of inadvertently encouraged the emergence of nationalist movements in opposition to French occupation in places like the German states, in places like Italy, uh, Spain, and other areas of Europe. So when we think about the characteristics of nationalism, modern nationalism is really about turning cultural unity into self-government. So it turns cultural unity into self-government. Nationalism encourage us, encourages us to develop a common language, right? So it's this idea that we have this common language, this common history, common traditions, common values. And these bring about a political loyalty and a political unity, right? So it's our common language, common history, common tradition, common culture, common values that brings about political unity and political loyalty. Now, in the first half of the 19th century, uh, nationalism is going to be more closely associated with liberalism, right? And it will work with liberalism to, um, to, to essentially cause many of these revolutions and upheavals that we see. So in the first half of the 19th century, it's associated with liberalism, whereas in the second half of the 19th century, it is going to be associated more with conservatism. As conservatives adapt their methods um, and embrace nationalism as a means to achieve their goals in the second half of the 19th century. And as we know, nationalism will also inspire many national revolutionary movements all throughout the 19th century in the first and second half of the century. Now, another key component of nationalism is this idea of self-determination. Self-determination is the idea that each ethnic group or nationality should have its own government, right? The idea that each ethnic group should have its own government. They should have their own clearly defined nation state. That's what we mean by self-determination. And when there's, there's two examples of this that we'll see. The first is when divided peoples uh, wanted unity, right? So divided peoples like the Germans or the Italians, peoples that had been divided and decentralized for millennia, uh, 
at this point now wanted that political unification. And then the second way we see self-determination is when subject peoples wanted their own nation, right? They wanted independence. They no longer wanted to be oppressed. These subject peoples wanted their own nation. Now, the best example of this is, of course, in the Austrian Empire, this multi-ethnic empire, and the Hungarians, which made up the largest minority group in Austria, um, will be the first to achieve some degree of self-determination. Now, it is this, this characteristic of nationalism more than any other that threatens to upset the existing political order that Metternich and the Congress of Vienna so carefully crafted um, in the early 19th century because a united Germany or Italy will severely disrupt the balance of power. To be honest, Germany uh, disrupt, disrupts the balance of power a lot more than Italy. Italy is not going to be quite as powerful and influential. More on that later. Um, and also, self-determination will ultimately contribute to the outbreak of World War I. And we could also even say it will, it will be a major factor in the interwar period between um, World War I and World War II. So that's why self-determination in particular, this is what scared people like Metternich, right? This is what would cause a lot of change. It would disrupt the balance of power. It would disrupt that conservative status quo. All right, so last two bullet points here. Um, these next two men are considered to be um, philosophers who established that that intellectual foundation of nationalism, right? So national, while nationalism is first manifested in France and with the rise of Napoleon, these two men are considered to be very influential in the intellectual development of nationalism. So first we have Johann Gottfried Herder. So Johann Gottfried Herder is considered to be the father of modern nationalism. And his ideas are, of course, uh, reflected in a lot of the characteristics I just discussed. He saw every cultural group as unique, and he believed that every cultural group possessed a distinct national character that, ca that evolved over many centuries, right? So we have all these unique cultural groups uh, with these unique, distinct national characters. He called this concept the Volkgeist, the Volkgeist, I'll spell it for you. It is V-O-L-K-G-E-I-S-T, the Volkgeist. That means, that's German for basically the spirit of the people. But unlike many other German nationalists, Herder uh, did not believe that any one culture was superior to another. Right? So we believe all these cultures were more or less equal. And his ideas led to the notion that every nation should be sovereign and it should contain all members of the same nationality. So France should have all the French people. Italy should all be, have all the Italians. Germany should have all the Germans. Spain should have all the Spanish. This strongly influences that idea of self-determination, of course. Now, the reality here is that no nation state is going to be completely homogenous. Um, there's always going to be uh, different sort of ethnic makeup. Even people who might identify as one nationality or another will likely have um, some cultural history or heritage from other regions of Europe. Essentially, we're all mutts as people. Um, but it's really more about the identity. So like if you identify as French, you identify as Italian or German, that encourages the creation and loyalty to a nation state. And then lastly, we have Johann Gottlieb Fichte. And Johann Gottlieb Fichte is considered to be the father of German nationalism. And we know that uh, German nationalism tends to be a bit more extreme, right? So, for example, Fichte believed that 
Uh, Germans were superior to all other peoples, uh, all other peoples in Europe, and he especially criticized Jews, right? Um, like most uh, extreme German nationalism, he will see Jews as very un-German and uh, does not want Jews to be a part of a new united Germany. This also brings us to the important point that anti-Semitism in the 19th century is no longer based in religious differences. It's based in um, racial differences, right? Jews were seen as a different race. Um, they, they, uh, no one believed that they, they could belong to a nation state. You know, they referred to as a people without a nation state. And um, that's what's going to fuel a lot of the more hostile anti-Semitism in the later 19th century. Now, eventually, yes, we will see Jewish nationalism emerge. That's called Zionism, Z-I-O-N-I-S-M. Um, but that's not really going to find any success until the 20th century, especially after the World Wars. And that's another story for another day. Moving on to our last ideology of the lecture is socialism. Um, so some of the sort of causes and basics of socialism. Uh, so socialism is an ideology that emerged after nationalism and liberalism and conservatism. Socialism is ultimately a product of the Industrial Revolution because socialism is a reaction to the inequality caused by capitalism, which becomes evident during the Industrial Revolution. Socialism was very critical of some of the even more liberal practices. Like it's not even so much a reaction against uh, early conservatism as it is a reaction against some of this early liberalism. Because uh, political liberalism and economic liberalism promoted this sort of selfish individualism, right? This idea that like the, the individual is the most important um, element of society, right? That the, the, the individual is entitled to these natural rights, entitled to economic freedom, right? But it gets to, the, but according to socialists, this gets to the point where this individualism becomes almost selfish and in fact contributes to the fragmenting of society. And so thinkers begin, like uh, even Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill, so some of these early intellectuals began to recognize that there needed to be some type of reorganization in society, right? Uh, that there needed to be some attention paid to the working class. Uh, that, so, that we need to do something to address this inequality. There needed to, be, needed to be some type of reorganization. But it was not until the later 19th century um, did the issue of social justice and social welfare reform really gain a broad intellectual base and greater political support. Now, moving on to the basics of socialism. Socialism is actually probably the most um, uh, continuous in what it's about between the 19th century, the 20th century, even to the 20th, into the 21st century, right? The, the, the fundamental goals and values of socialism really do not change, whereas liberalism and, and, and conservatism do. So one of the fundamental ideas of socialism is that the government should intervene to address inequality, right? There's many ways of doing this, which of course helps us to determine moderate versus more extreme socialism. Uh, for example, the more radical socialism we see from say Karl Marx, you know, that leads to communism, that advocates for revolution, right? A revolution of the proletariat. That's the scary form of socialism to many people. Um, but more mainstream socialism, that evolutionary socialism that we've discussed, it supports reform. And its, re and its main objective was to advocate for government protection for workers. So that includes things like health care and 
uh, retirement benefits, um, disability insurance, things like that, things to uh, help equalize the playing field. Um, evolutionary socialists, as we will see, tended to support universal male suffrage, right? They were not about a revolution, but if they were able to achieve universal male suffrage, which meant that the working class got to vote, uh, then they could then form political parties, they could run for seats in the government, they could win elections, and then they could affect change by implementing policies that reflected their values. And that's how more of this mainstream socialism will find eventual success later in the century. And today we'll also see some examples of utopian socialism, which was more common in the early 20th century, uh, where some social reformers were quite idealistic in their interpretation of socialism and wanted to create these um, isolated communities that were defined by cooperation, not competition, where everything was shared and everyone held, ha held hands and sang kumbaya around the campfire every night, which, as we know, is not realistic. And finally, socialism is going to be supported by the working class, right? Conservatism is supported by the upper classes, the nobility, the aristocracy, the church. Uh, liberalism is supported by the middle classes, uh, the bourgeoisie, and socialism is supported by the working classes. And also some um, radical intellectuals, you know, students, writers, sometimes professors, they also could be big supporters of socialism. So we're going to look at um, some early socialists. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about any one of these guys, but um, it is possible that you may see their names at some point, if not on my test, then on the AP. And so I want you to at least have a context. Um, for these names. These are considered to be illustrative examples from the College Board. So first we have Count Henri de Saint-Simon. He was French and I'm not sure whether we could really characterize him as a reformer, as a revolutionary, or as a utopian socialist. If anything, we might label him a reformer. So Saint-Simon recognized that industrialization was bringing about this wondrous new age to Europe. And therefore, society needed some serious reorganization. For example, he believed that uh, European society should require the, quote, parasites the traditional ruling groups like the aristocracy, the church, even the courts, you know, judges and lawyers, he believed that those, quote, parasites should be pushed aside and instead uh, a new group, the industrialists, the uh, scientists, the engineers, what he called the, quote, doers, that this group should be leading society. Right, so let's get rid of the old traditional aristocracy. They're no longer relevant. Now we need new leaders in society to support Europe in this wondrous new age of industrialization. He also believed that part of this uh, social reorganization should require every social institution to um, uh, improve conditions for the poor, right? That that should be the main goal for every social institution, that they should improve conditions for the poor. So he, he was really, I would say, more of a reformer. Next, we have Louis Blanc. Uh, Louis Blanc is definitely a reformer, right? An evolutionary socialist. He had a much more practical approach than other early French socialists. Um, for example, he was a strong advocate for universal male suffrage, right? If he was able to achieve universal male suffrage in France, then the workers could take control of the state peacefully through um, legislative means. Now, he also believed that the, it was the, the, the role of the government, the, the responsibility of the government, 
to address issues of unemployment. Specifically, he believed that the government should set up workshops and factories to guarantee full employment. And actually, Louis Blanc will briefly be successful in these goals, right, in achieving universal suffrage, in getting the government to provide jobs to the working class. However, this success will get, will become part of the um, 1848 revolution in France, which does get very, very messy, as we will learn later on. But remember, Louis Blanc will see him again. Next, we have Pierre-Joseph Proudhon. And Pierre-Joseph Proudhon is not even, a, uh, you know, a radical, uh, a radical Marxist. He is like off the charts radical. Um, one of his key ideas is that he believed that private property was the root of all evil, right? He believed that private property was bad. It was profit that was stolen from workers. Um, private property is what caused all sorts of inequality. Now, of course, these ideas will um, influence Karl Marx as he writes the Communist Manifesto. But I would not even go so far as to say Pierre Joseph is a revolutionary socialist. He's beyond that. He was actually more of an anarchist than anything um, because he greatly feared and mistrusted the power of the state. Next is Charles Fourier. Uh, Charles Fourier is definitely a utopian socialist. So Charles Fourier um, wanted to create these perfect socialist communities with planned economies. Um, Fourier was even able to describe a socialist utopia in mathematical detail. So he was able to mathematically defend what this utopia would look like. And his ideas were successful enough that they did lead to the creation of a handful of these utopian communities, mostly in the United States, none of which were very successful in the long run, right? Because these utopian socialist communities are exactly that, utopian, and therefore un unobtainable. But one other interesting thing about Fourier is he actually was an early proponent of the total emancipation of women. So interestingly enough, a lot of early um, movements for female equality can be found in socialism and with socialist leaders and thinkers because they uh, believed that these ideas of equality should apply to everyone in society, not just the men. So even before there is more mainstream um, uh, feminism and fighting for, for suffrage and equality in the early 20th century, we see uh, some socialist reformers advocating for female equality much, much earlier in the 19th century. Next is Robert Owen. Uh, so Robert Owen was a Scottish industrialist who worked in England and he is also a utopian socialist. Um, after 1815 or so, uh, he also began to experiment with these utopian uh, socialist communities based entirely on cooperation and shared property. And once again, none of them were really successful in the long run. However, Robert Owen was more successful in his advocacy for labor unions. So he was an early advocate for labor unions for workers. Um, he advocated that unions should be legalized and workers should be allowed to um, organize together to advocate for improved working conditions. But uh, there will be a lot of resistance to, union, to unionization in the first part of the 19th century. So while that was not immediately successful in the long run, um, it is. Okay, next is this um, idea of Christian socialism. Um, I call Christian socialism sort of the like, what would Jesus do socialism? 
And this was not necessarily as mainstream as evolutionary socialism. It wasn't as um, commonly known as Marxism, right? It was really kind of a, a, a smaller um, group of socialists uh, that were mostly based in England. Um, so Christian socialists believed that the evils of industrialization could be ended by following Christian principles, right? And so if you think about um, a lot of uh, the teachings of Christ in the New Testament, he talks about help the sick and the needy, care for the poor, love thy neighbor, welcome the stranger. And so these were really the values embraced by those Christian socialists. Um, and they wanted to hopefully bridge the gap between their values of Christian social justice and some of the other socialist movements on the continent, which were mostly viewed as anti-religious. Um, it's also, uh, uh, I think, significant to point out that Christian socialism was reflective of the Victorian era in Great Britain. So what I mean by that is um, the Victorian era, which we'll be discussed later, was reflective of sort of a, a, a religious revival, right? Um, a culture that embraced a lot of Christian morals and values and practices. That was really a defining characteristic of Victorian culture. So the emergence of Christian socialism in that context is not altogether that surprising. And then finally on this list, we have Friedrich Engels, probably one of the more famous of the early socialists. Now, you might know Friedrich Engels because he does co he will co-write the Communist Manifesto with Karl Marx. But he had his own work and his own ideas even before his collaboration with Marx. Engels detested the middle class, right? He absolutely abhorred the middle class and blamed them for everything that was wrong in society. Um, so obviously he is a revolutionary, more radical socialist. He condemns the working class and all of their evils in another writing called The Conditions of the Working Class in England. The Conditions of the Working Class in England. And this was published in 1844, just a few years before the Communist Manifesto. Um, he believed, like Marx, that the capitalist middle class ruthlessly exploited the proletariat for their own gain, right? He, his anger towards the middle class is really quite shocking. In fact, one passage from his writings says the following, I charge the English middle classes with mass murder, wholesale robbery, and all the other crimes in the calendar. That's pretty intense. And of course, his ideas will influence Marx and other latest, later socialists who also um, subscribe to the more Marxist style of socialism. Now, our last slide for this section is um, going to dive in a little bit more to uh, Marxism, or as we may also call it, communism. Um, it is also sometimes referred to as scientific socialism, just to make it extra confusing for you all. So Marxism, scientific socialism, communism are all essentially the main thing. This is, like I've said before, the radical form of socialism. While we have the more moderate evolutionary socialism that advocates for reform, Marxism is all about that revolution. And so the Communist Manifesto, which was written by Karl Marx, and Friedrich Engels becomes the Bible of communism. So it intended to replace these utopian hopes and dreams that we see from early French socialists like, you know, Fourier and Robert Owen, even to some extent Saint-Simon. So he wants to he wants to replace those utopian ideals of hopes and dreams and change with a brutal militant blueprint for the socialist working class success, right? 
So he argues that we need a carefully organized revolution to seize power from the bourgeoisie and give it to the proletariat. Now, the Communist Manifesto also outlines what is called the theory of dialectical materialism. Okay, so this is a, a, a worldview that also is, is more or less defined by Marxism. This is what Marxism is all about. And so this is essentially Marx's blueprint and, and, and um, rationale for a uh, revolution. So first, it suggests an, an economic interpretation of history, that all of human history is defined by economic factors, primarily those who control the means of production, like the landowners or the factory owners, and those who don't, right? So he believes all of history is determined by these economic factors. And therefore, going to the next bullet point, all of history is also a class struggle. Since the beginning of time, there has been this class struggle between the rich and the poor, the exploiters and the exploited, the bourgeoisie versus the proletariat, which is the terminology we really will use in the 18th century, 19th century, excuse me. This also contributes to the theory of surplus value. The theory of surplus value is that the true value of a product is actually the labor going into it. And since the worker only receives a small portion of his just labor price, which is the wage, the difference of that, um, the difference or the profit that the say, factory owner makes is what we call surplus value, right? So because the factory owner keeps the profits from whatever is being manufactured, um, Marx believes that that surplus value, that profit is stolen from the worker by the capitalist, right? And that is what we have seen all throughout history, but also especially in the French, in the Industrial Revolution. Marx also argued that socialism was inevitable, that capitalism contained the seeds of its own destruction by promoting this extreme inequality, right? The growing gap between the rich and the poor, the overproduction with industrialization, the unemployment that's evident in the cities. Marx believed that over time, capitalism would... Um, would become the enemy of the people and, and the people would embrace this revolution to get rid of capitalism, which of course brings me to the next and really important point, the idea of this violent revolution as the solution to all of these problems. So this increasing gap between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie would be so great that the working classes will rise up in revolution and overthrow the elite bourgeoisie, basically what I was just saying. And in this violent revolution, uh, there would then be a dictatorship of the proletariat to mandate this equality. So they would get, uh, so they would get um, rid of all private property, right? We're not even quite sure what would happen to the bourgeoisie in this scenario, but ultimately there would be this dictatorship of the proletariat. Um, now, of course, what this also means in reality, like when we actually see a communist revolution in Russia, is that to achieve this mandated equality, uh, it requires a very authoritarian government. But Marx doesn't really get that far in his, his thinking yet. Now, one of the rallying cries for, for communism and for Marxism um, throughout history across the world is this phrase, working men of all countries unite. So working men of all countries unite. That is one of the big rallying cries for Marxism and this type of uh, proletarian revolution. So the goal at the end of the day is a classless society. Right? This would be the natural result uh, 
when modern cap capitalism is completely dismantled. Um, and we would have this classless society mandated equality. And Marx believed that in this society, we would follow the following mantra. From each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. So from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. This is another sort of key phrase in Marxism, that in this society, people would contribute what they were able according to their needs, right? There would, this implies a, a level of cooperation, which is also somewhat utopian, you could argue. Now, one of the other things that has made Marxism and, and communism really scary um, in uh, modern history, especially to Americans, is that Marxism is considered to be an atheistic philosophy. So atheism is a, a lack of belief in God or religion. So an atheist does not believe in God, does not believe in any type of religion. So Marx was what was essentially uh, an atheist who argued against organized religion. He believed that religion was the opiate or the drug of the people or the opiate of the masses. Um, what this means is basically he believed that religion um, supported this conformity, supported this, um, su supported this complacency by the proletariat and uh, which allowed them to continue to be exploited by the bourgeoisie. And of course, in American society, which has a lot of, of Christian values and Christian religious influence, this was another thing that uh, sort of made communism scary and different and very un-American. Now, last point here is um, Marxism and its views on women, which was surprisingly progressive for its time. Marx saw women as being doubly oppressed by capitalists who paid them low wages and exploited their labor and by society that gave women second class status, right? So he recognized that women are, are overly oppressed. They're being paid lower wages. They're oppressed by society, right? That women too deserved equality in his classless society. And women would eventually play a very influential role in the socialist movement in the 19th century and early 20th centuries. Um, obviously, since socialism was really one of the first political ideologies to advocate for women's equality, it will attract uh, some of those more educated, intellectual uh, uh, female radicals. Uh, one example is Flora Tristan. Uh, so Flora is spelled F-L-O-R-A, and her last name Tristan is T-R-I-S-T-A-N. Um, and she was uh, an influential socialist writer and um, women's suffrage advocate in the first half of the 19th century, and we'll probably learn a little bit more about her later. For now, I'm going to take a brief break uh, to end this first section, and we will pick up with the next section where we dive into those uprisings, those revolutions, and even some reform.